All right. Whoa. <laughs> I don't need my hearing aids for this now, huh? <laughs> Hello. No, no. It's, is it all right? It's fine. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. And now that thing has no longer, no longer, uh, and I can't see again. It's supposed to. I've been. All right, thank you everyone for coming to my talk. Uh, this is your Frost Productive Life, the vibrant ecosystems around applications. And I am your host, Sri Ram Krishna. I am a community manager at Intel for One API. Uh, I started uh, working in the app ecosystem around 1997. So I've been, I've been doing like desktop things, app things for quite some amount of time. Um, it, it, interestingly enough, uh, I this is where I kind of learned community building. So, like my corporate life came from working on GNOME and building the community and doing engagement and all those kind of things. Uh, so it, it, it's sort of interesting how how much working on on these on this ecosystem um, really moved my career. Uh, I am working for Tel, but I'm not representing my employer um today so let's start with uh defining what is an app ecosystem and it might be worth looking at, at what this is now not everybody is represented in this photo uh but if you start at the bottom we have ecosystems like free desktop uh waylon keith is not here so i i'm he won't be offended. I didn't put X11 uh, on this, but uh, so uh, X11, you know, the Linux kernel, all these things. These are the bottom parts of that are adjacent, right? They represent the the kernel. They represent the display. They represent uh, uh, all these things, hardware uh, at the bottom, and then the distributions take that and then create an operating system. And, you know, I've put a sampling of these distributions. And on top of that is the desktop, right? And so you have GNOME, you have KDE, you have XFCE, if you have elementary, LXQ. So a huge number. And there's a wide variety of this. All of these are part of the app ecosystems. And then uh, finally, we have GTK and Qt. Uh, these are two toolkits. Of course, they're not the only toolkits. There's uh, Swift and uh, various... Uh, of um, Electron, so these are all also toolkits that we can use that are web-based. I did not represent that because that would be a lot of work to put there, and I would like to make a very simple chart. But this is what it was. Uh, this is how it all started, right? But what else is the app ecosystem is the community, right? Community is the most important part of any, uh, any ecosystem, and uh, I, I think one of the great things about the app ecosystem is we need everybody. It's a it's a full suite, right? And you might think, okay, coders, but there we need a lot more than just coders, right? There are people who need designers. Uh, we need people who know how to do social media, uh, people who document. I learned event planning at GNOME because I started off... Uh, doing a, a conference. I started a conference and learned how to fundraise. I, learned, I, I mean, literally, uh, you can come in here and start learning all kinds of new skill sets because we need them. Uh, uh, and I, I think the, the part I love most of all is people who make you feel good and they support you in the work you're doing because working on a desktop is hard. Working on build, working and supporting uh, building apps is hard. So it's not just coders or maintainers, it's everyone. And it, you won't believe how much like a, a project manager is such a huge skill set here because they turn, they make order out of chaos. And so if you're a maintainer, having somebody coming in there and then being able to triage your bugs and, and handle uh, 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 problems, or if there's a fight because somebody's upset because you said no, so having a community person come in and sort of 
reduce things. So these are all uh, parts that that I think is great because you're building really building a full product. So of course these these um, these skill sets are important. And then there's the platform itself, right? Uh, you have the kernel drivers, the operation. It's sort of like the previous slide, but you have the kernel drivers, you have the operating system, you have the application frameworks, uh, the applications themselves, and then always on top is the community and user base. So one of the reasons why I gave this talk is I'm really excited about where things are going. I, I, I generally found that the work we do is sort of hidden in the scheme of things right? over over a period of time uh, very at the beginning right back in the early 90s or late 90s and mid 2000s like the desktop was a thing and the web was a thing and uh, and there was this huge uh, comedy between kernel developers the uh, uh, the X guard people and all of that and it was this it was this really fun thing because we we're putting on there, but we we're really focused on the 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 desktop and so forth. And after a period of time, it became data centers, containers, and so forth. And we kind of got pushed off. Like where where were we? And so, but we may be hidden because there was such a huge explosion of open source. We ourselves were not present, right? Like if you go to a lot of uh, conferences unlike this one you don't see the the the, the gnome or the xfc or those people giving talks or even in around right um but that doesn't mean things are not happening and this is one of the reasons why i wanted to give this talk is that we're actually going through a renaissance it's 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 really interesting to see because a lot of things started coming together it, back back in the day we were probably doing software engineering using some really basic stuff right and uh, it was it's funny how much work we did do just on those basic tools right a lot of people have a lot of these corporate tools uh or they even have corporate people coming in and helping but we don't have that we just we just doing really basic things. We didn't. We were using just Git for the most part uh, with a with a web server, and like where other people were using GitHub, GitLab, CI pipelines, you know, and um, and that's why I feel like the genesis of this renaissance is that we made some changes in our ecosystem. And they're important because they they drive the kind of this renaissance that's happening, uh, because we improved our tooling and our software engineering. So I got a quick timeline here, um, and if you it, if you go down through this, uh, we all moved to Git in two thousand nine. And one of the interesting things uh, around two thousand nine was I will claim that we were the biggest communities to move to Git first uh, at that period of time, other than the kernel. And what we actually validated using Git because it was a choice between Git and BZR at the time. And we did this huge thing where we we're comparing and then we eventually moved to Git. And we validated that, and everybody moved after that. KDE moved, a whole bunch of moved, the distros moved, and um, and so forth. And then um, the next thing we looked at was understanding how packaging worked. And packaging was uh, an industry problem for us uh, because of how packaging, how distros started getting uh were being built right packaging was the important thing but when you're there are some problems with packaging that i found going forward that um 
that made it problematic for us. And uh, this is where flat pack comes in. And flat pack, if you don't know, is essentially a, a containerized um, runtime. And the problem I had with packaging and very others is that if you had an app you downloaded and you installed on your distro, it came with its own tool chain, right? So they had their own version of a uh, different version of GCC. They had their own version of libraries. And so if you look at each the software bill of materials for each of those apps, they behave differently in every distro. So if you were an app maintainer, if you wanted to do an app in those days, you were maintaining a bug database of every distro or or the distro will have their own sort of bug thing, but every one of them would behave slightly differently and exhibit different kinds of bugs. And it, it's, it makes maintaining an app kind of difficult. But you managed to do it. Um, and if you were a closed, uh, uh, like a proprietary app, right, you ended up having to package for everything, right? You would build a Debian package, an RPM package, and, and, and so forth. So it, the, 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 the app story back then was really um, complicated. But Flatpak says, I'm going to give you a pinned environment. And so when you're running a Flatpak uh, application, it is exactly the same thing coming out of their Git, right? So it behaves the same way with, the, with a pin set of runtimes. I'm going to go back to my client. So the other thing we did was we moved to GitLab. And then a whole bunch of, same thing with Git. I, uh, the reason I'm telling these stories is that is the sheer amount of influence we, that come in there. Like when we pick something, there's a huge... Uh, well, of things going forward, joining us, right? So when we when we did the evaluation, just like we did with Git, when we did the evaluation for GitLab, uh, KDE, Debian, uh, Fedora, I believe, and and uh, various others joined. That's true. So you know, we did that work. Now everybody wants to follow and and do the same thing. And that's where the turning point comes in, because I was talking about the maturity of software tools, and. Now we are, we have moved into a, a, a place where we're having modern tooling and we're able to do those CI, CD pipelines that modern softwares are doing. And we have issues, we have wikis, we're, we're, we're just really like finally getting our infrastructure to a point where we're doing real software engineering. And that really translates to much higher quality software. And that's also enables uh, well, GNOME OS. And this is the other interesting part of this renaissance, right? Because one, one thing is we always depended on the distros for the tooling underneath. But the distros don't always have the same goals we do. Uh, a distro will, will also be focused on server uh, paradigms as well as desktop ser uh, paradigm, right? So if you're interested as a, uh, a, a desktop uh, person, right, you want to be able to know, hey, what's the experience from turning it on all the way to getting into the desktop? So we might not always, not everybody might always agree with that. But now we get some ability to do some innovations from that user space. And, and, and we're not the only one. KDE has actually been doing this way before we did. And they have a similar OS called KDE Neon. The difference between KDE Neon and GNOME OS is that KDE Neon uses Ubuntu as its base. Uh, GNOME OS is built from scratch. It has no packaging. It is purely straight out of our Git and and, and uh, install that way. But ultimately, both of those desktops lead, uh, put out their latest software for everybody to test 
uh, I mean, largely for at least for GNOME OS is, is really to do q and A. I I don't know a lot about GNOME. Uh, I'm sorry about KD Neon. So I don't want to speak for that. But so I'm going to focus more on uh, on GNOME OS because I'm much more aware of what's going on with that. So let's talk about what GNOME OS does, right? GNOME OS allows designers to prototype ID, new ideas quickly. So if we're trying to do new design patterns, we are able to do that. So if you want to find out what, what, how can we make apps look different, how go better or more interesting, right? Better designs. Uh, so that's where GNOME OS that because we can do that QA. Uh, we can uh, give, try out new ideas, give them to people to test out and, and say, hey, okay, we can actually do user studies, right? We could do focus groups. We can do find ways to make uh, these things more interesting. Uh, to, to really get that user input to say, okay, does this does this idea work? Does it not work? So forth. This is the high building a high quality software, right? We GNOME is extremely focused on high quality. And and we're we're very interested in if there's a regression or because look look at this way you're working on uh, you know, some document or something and you don't want your OS to crash and lose all your data right because the number one thing is keeping you is keeping you safe your data loss is does not keep you safe and nobody wants to lose all the work you put together and so having high amount of testing is important in fact uh, we've been we've been hooking this up with open qa so we've been working with uh this has been like a joint project between gnome fedora and OpenSUSE. they're all working on qa right so these these are great examples of communities coming together and and trying to solve those problems and uh, ultimately uh, we want the community to have a chance to test run gnome at any time and this is especially great if, if you're if you're uh, looking especially let's say you're a media or something you want to say hey what's going on what's new whatever it's a great way to test it uh, so that's that's a one of those uh, cool things and uh, where this is uh, just for GNOME OS is like an image basis right you use something called OS tree which uh, Fedora uh, has something called Silver Blue. It's very similar to that. The idea is that the root partition is immutable, meaning you can't touch it, it's read only, and you're actually just using Flatpak uh, to install apps, right? So you're sort of, again, moving away from the, the kind of the, the packaging kind of thing. Although you're still using packaging, but you're getting your main apps um, from Flatpak, which will be important later uh, in this talk. So uh, this is the idea of doing distro engineering, and um, there, there, there's one of the, one of the things we, we've been fooling around with uh, is uh, is the idea of using something called systemd sysupdate, and um, it does some interesting things for you, right? Uh, it provides a completely uh, safe trust chain from the moment you turn it on and I'll give you a good example of this uh, Leonard Pottering uh, in fact the idea for this thing came from Leonard Pottering right? Leonard Pottering had had a couple stories Leonard Pottering is is an international international man of mystery um, and he gets into situations that I'm I'm always uh, uh, amused by but because he works on a major, he's the maintainer of System D. Because he's um, he's such a uh, he works on a piece of software that's so central that um, uh, various three-letter agencies are always interested <laughs> where he is in a in a in a hotel room. So uh, I think the one story he wa he wanted me to tell you was uh, he was in China at one point. And he left his laptop in, in a hotel room. And he left, and he came back, and he picked up his laptop, and all the screws came out. 
<laughs> so the Chinese government had broken it, and and there was this thing where uh, they were trying to prevent him from going out by some excuses to give him enough time to go and search his laptop. So so you know interdiction, I think is the term is an important thing so that you know if you're if you're going somewhere you want to make sure that nobody's fooling around with your laptop so so this is sort of like the idea behind why system d sys update is it, it, where it comes to it. but it's also has the ability of saying being able to do a full factory reset like get it back to the last good state uh they have ideas of doing a b a b this is a the a b scheme is like android like when you're on your phone and you get an update on an android like it's actually downloading on a different part. And then when you ask you to reboot, it swaps. And so it's a safe way because if something goes wrong, you can swap back. And plus automatic update. And these distro engineering ideas are, is, is interesting in a different way. And I'll tell that later. The, the, uh, going back to the, the story by Leonard, uh, the idea was encrypted home directories. And we're using systemd, homed. And this this means that your home directory, or your private, your data is ubiquitable, right? You could you could store your home directory anywhere because to access it is actually using a GPG key to encrypt it. So you actually don't need your SC password uh, for certain types of use cases. And in this case, you can uh, decrypt it and. And take it out. So you could actually put it on your USB stick or some other kind of thing and, and uh, leave it there. So that's again going back to safety and making sure that you know nobody can access your data unless you want to. So these are kind of like these uh, distro engineering kind of things. And why do we why do we do that? Um, because no one else is going to do it. Only our ecosystem is going to care about that experience. Uh, because we're the ones driving that, right? So if you're using a desktop or, or a laptop or whatever, we're gonna care about that safety. We're gonna care about the encryption. So those, but also those experimentation means that we can, we can provide those solutions to other companies who may want to use them or other communities. And anyway, I, I said all this, it's basically to create a better community. But one of these things, a lot of these these concepts are going to be great for like a phone OS, right? Being able to do A, B uh, swaps, being able to encrypt your home directory. These are all things or ways to, um, that would make a great safe phone experience. And there might, there might be places where other people could use it as well. So, you know, we're, this is our contribution to the overall open source community um, by doing that experimentation from a different lens, right? And and that's that's the best part of having a diverse ecosystem, many ecosystems collaborating together, is that we can find new ways to work together. Um, I, I did say about control environments, some more stuff there, uh, again, ideas of where we could we could test uh, like how do we how do we met, let apps uh, use less memory how do we make them faster how about power management if you're running your you know actually for first is this laptop has done pretty good it's been I've been using it all day I haven't touched it I haven't plugged it in once it's only at 60 percent I was like all day that's like for the longest time it I would be done in two hours. So, you know, that kind of profiling means that we're using the, the apps are becoming more efficient, at least from a power perspective. And I already talked about design experience from power on. So, so I'm going to change uh, from distro engineering to, you know, we were talking about the apps in your own home life. And um, thanks to Flatpak, we actually get an app store. And I think this is like one of the greatest things we've accomplished in the last three, four years is building this app store and being able to um, incorporate p 
people easily able to get apps. One of the things that makes, uh, that was problematic, let's say from an app uh, a, a programmer, right? When you get your app, when you, for, let's say from a distro, and you're using app get install or DNF install or whatever it is from either from a command line or using GitHub software, let me ask you this. Where is the app developer in that exchange? There is no. The, 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 pers the, the most important person who wants to know who's using their app is not in that relationship. So you're completely bypassed the app developer. They have no way to talk to you, get your feedback. And if, if it's not, unless they already know how this process works, right? And, but, but using an app store, we can actually, they can actually have an opportunity to have a conversation with you uh, in sub or get you to participate in their, in, in, in uh, the, the development or feedback or whatever it is. And so I'm gonna take an example here, Planify. Planify is one of my favorite apps. And uh, one, of, one of the big jokes that I always found uh, when we talk about apps in the oh, in Linux world, I always joke, joke about it, I said, apps always end up being what I would call programmer adjacent. It's everything we do while we're programming. And it's always be like 10, uh, 10 to 30 music apps. There'll be 10 to 30 video apps because that's what we do when we're programming. And so we would have a whole bunch of those. But now, Thanks to this, we're actually doing other things. We're finding little tools that we can write, maybe little PDF tools or tools that uh, like, like uh, tracks your uh, exercise or things like that, right? But Planify, I'm, I'm a programmer and project manager at work. I actually use this extensively because I, I, uh, I do my to-dos, I put notes on it. I can actually have, um, uh, what is it? Uh, put them in columns where you could say done, not done. It's like it's I, I can do a, my full job on there and I'm not using any uh, proprietary software. So I love this. So if you look closely, um, this is how we distinguish ourselves from other app stores is we talk about what is the impact of this app on you and for you know, if you look at the top part, you see changes, right? Um, you get an idea of what changed from the last time. But then it also tells you what the permissions are set to. So it says potentially unsafe because your home directory has written right access. It has access to your disk. So there could be some risk there. And you can actually change that if you want to. The other part is it's very community forward. So if you look on the right, you'll see community built. That means we care about community. We want you to get involved. And so you can say that, yes, this is released under the GPL. If it was proprietary, we would actually say, hey, this is a proprietary app. If you look further down here, you'll see there are three links here, information, links, and statistics. So this is the other things that's changed, right? If you're using packaging you wouldn't know how many people are using that or how many downloaded or or anything like that and and for the user they know how big this, this big app is and uh, what it's available on but the key part here is this app has 204,000 installations which Gives you a gauge of how big this community is. Now, it's probably larger because some people are probably getting it from their distros too, right? But that's a pretty pretty big number. The other part of it is, so when you go to the links, you have a project website. You have uh, you have some way. So this is, again, going back, we want we want the community to interact with this app or with the app distro. So you have the you know where to, you know where to go, where the project website is. You know how to contribute in some fashion. Maybe it's transaction. Maybe you want this app to be in the language you know, right? And then uh, where is the source code? This is where the source code is. And then 
if you want to report a bug, you know where to go. And then finally, the manifest is is just like if you if you go to the supermarket and you look at a can of soup and you want to know what's in it. That's what this manifest is. The manifest tells you it's a software bill of uh, bill of materials that tells you everything that was required to make this app. All right, and then finally, uh, for the app developer, what they're seeing is how popular this app is. 300 downloads a day. So potentially 300 people, or like maybe 300, maybe less. Maybe there's some guy who's downloading it and installing it five times because he just loves doing that. But, you know, <laughs> but but it gives you an idea. Oh, yeah, this is this is people like this app and they're motivated because it's not just if you're if you're starting this app part of the motivation to keep going is that people are using it and and they're participating in it and so forth i gotta go faster i meant time is it it's uh, i got another 10 minutes okay so um i i, I joked about having um there, there's not a wide variety of apps in the old days. And um, and uh, I, I'm reiterating my joke because I, I got impatient. I wanted to tell it earlier. But uh, but here here's like a here's a couple couple apps that I, I liked. And um, one was Alpaca. So you can actually do that prompt engineering like chat GPT. Um, you could you could but it, you're not going to open AI. You're actually downloading the uh, LLM models directly to your uh, computer and then interacting with them that way. So that way you're, you're, you can get ChatGPT with that and not go to other places. There's Boxy SFG, it's an SVG editor. Uh, Jogger is essentially a jogging app. You could, it's actually more phone-based and it can track your jogging on a map so stuff like that and for some reason i don't remember what stockpile is uh but exercise timer uh just kind of lets you know hey uh, how much uh how much time do i'm going to do this exercise blanket is my favorite blanket is uh, for people who are, who who like me who have ADHD, or and and need white noise, uh, but it's not white noise. It is coffee house noise. So you you can put it in there, and it's like a coffee house. And I, I see that you're you're finding that uh, amusing. But uh, let me see. Can I get the get on my mouse? But I, I'll oh there it is. Uh, let me see what happens. I'm worried that I'm won't be able to get it back. Do you see something? All right. But I, I'll show that later. Come, come find me later. I'll show. And then capsule is medicine. It makes you a reminder of when to take your medication. So you know these are things we use in our daily lives, not necessarily program adjacent, and and so on. So what is the effect of, of Flat Hub Store, right? So here are some stats of how much traffic uh, the Flat Hub Store has. We have well over 2,600 apps on the store today. Uh, and they're transferring about 88 terabytes of data. They're doing 1. billion downloads a year. And um, we're there, the average download per month is 4 million. So that kind of gives you an idea of how many, how popular apps are in the app ecosystem. We're doing pretty good. And it's growing, it's actually accelerating. Um, and we added 500 new applications this year. And, and at a pace of about approximately 40 new applications a month. So people are enthusiastic to write apps and they have a place to do it because the process of building an app 
putting it into the store is a lot more is a lot less painful than it used to be. Plus, you don't have to deal with bugs in multiple distros. You know, you know, there's all kinds of good things. But the holy grail, the holy grail, is financial transactions. Because you know, people talk about your desktop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And everybody, every time people talk about that, I'm like, that's. And they always talk about, yeah, we just need that one great app. I go, that's not how the world works. The world works by how much money can I make on this, right? It's how much money. And, and this is especially true uh, if you're not in the Western Europe or uh, the U.S. or whatever. If you're, if you're from, say, the Middle East or Africa, and you're building an app, the, the value proposition is I build an app and I get some financial reward from that. And if you can't do that, then it's not. And so not being able to get money also uh, implies that you're not going to get diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you're not going to bring people of color because they don't have that kind of time. They're, it's 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 something um, that needs to happen. But once you realize what the value of the market is, and you're saying yes, this ecosystem can pull in five hundred million dollars because people are willing to pay for apps. That's when third-party app applications show up because you've enabled a way to get a an equitable transaction for the for the labor they've done. Otherwise, no. And and maybe when that what does you know if it gets wildly successful, you're going to see probably something similar <laughs> to what happened uh, when I was talking about how our our group started going away because moneyed interest comes in. You might even see that. Who knows? Uh, the one last thing I want to talk about is post market OS. Um, they're also part of our economy. But if you notice that things like the jogger, the, those are things that you can use on your phone today. I didn't bring my my PostMarket OS phone, but uh, if you go to the PostMarket uh, OS booth, uh, they've got apps there you can do. But, but what's exciting about this is, again, this is another avenue for applications. And we can now start designing apps for mobile uses or for... Um, uh, kiosk or all those things kind of fit in the same mold, right? So this engineering goes in there, all of them fit into that. So I think there is exciting times ahead. I think we're 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 just getting started, and uh, and I think again that key thing about getting financial activated um, is going to be really good, and we can answer questions like. Can an app writer be able to make a living as a FOSS developer? That would be great, right? A lot of people want to do that. And will this community actually uh, fund uh, a sustainable development for a developer? We do have, still have some challenges. Uh, a lot of folks don't like the idea of making money from apps. And sometimes they may be uh, might modify the behavior to code, and so that's so we you know if you look at around FOSS, they have all kinds of legal issues. Our legal issues comes down to if you modify an app and you distribute it, is it still? And it, I, I had this one where somebody said, "Oh yeah, if you put a if you put a thing say asking for money on your app, we'll remove the code and then put it back out there." So, but is it the same app? If, it, if you change the behavior of an app and the license says, yes, you can do that, do you still have access to the branding? Or is it really that thing if you changed it? So those are interesting challenges. Um, also, a lot of companies want to brand the desktop with their specificity. They want it to have their own themes. But if you change the icon of an app developers, you're changing their branding without their permission. So 
Now, those are other things in there. So those are important parts. So, but we want ex we want success. And I think the important thing that distinguishes us that we really truly care about privacy and security. Uh, and, and I would add safety as well. Um, and it, it's a clear distinguishing factor between proprietary and non-proprietary is, is that if you can trust it, you have the source code. All of you here understand that. Also, if if the the uh, the uh, uh, if the app ecosystem takes off, well, we're we're investing in th it, there's it uh, lifts all boats, right? Um, there's money in volunteers. Some of those goes into consumer hardware. Would be more interested in supporting us. Then those things go into the Linux kernel community, and and so there's so it lists all boats. So I have a few calls for action for you all. Uh, browse the apps on the um, Cloud Hub store. Uh, track what's going on in the ecosystem. Come to the ground food. Come to the post market room. And if you want to keep up, I have a few links this week in gnome.org docs.cloudhub.org, there's a blog, and KDE's uh, This Week in KDE. So I'll leave you with this thought. When working towards achieving your aims as a community, the highest compliment is not that you're achieving it, but that the progress is changing the lives for the better. So, thank you. I don't know, do we have time for, it's a break now, right? So if any have, anybody have questions, you can certainly try to. Yeah. Uh, uh, not you, do you, you raise your hand there? Uh, did you, oh no, uh, yeah. Uh, there's, I am not fully sure what, what they're doing. They're starting a nonprofit and then Gnome and Katie are behind it. That's still in negotiation, but I think it'd be something like Stripe or something like that. It'd be like that. But uh, it, there's a lot of complications going on there. So it's really hard to tell. Hmm? Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, that's that's what I'm seeing. There, there's a lot of complication. That's why it hasn't been, it hasn't happened yet. We started this, I think, almost a year and a half ago or something. So it continues to. And presumably, you will require some of the kit code. You probably want the open source development mandated stuff. Right. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that Flat Hat does is sort of these warnings about the Yeah. Do you think anybody is considered adding to it? I have not heard anything of that nature, but I do like that. I think I think that's that's something important. I think if we were to enable that it, it comes down to how does how do we communicate that? That would be like some kind of design so it would be both so it would be both the GNOME repository and the GNOME software, yeah. Something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I'll take that down. I, I, I think for two reasons, right? One is the security reason, right? Yes. Um, demanding extra permissions for things that are not in one instance and not done. Yeah. Right. One instance. Now, the second thing is, I can't wait for the compilation cycle, or the app doesn't work properly. I can't wait for Flat Two to figure out yeah. what it's asking for and able to move. Yeah. It. Yeah. So, yeah. It would be nice. Yeah, uh, let me let me ask that. Yeah. Uh, on FlatHub, it's communicated. Yeah, but but I, I, I don't think it's more authority. Huh. Not that he's a flat 
I don't I don't get that either. I'm it may be in the work. I, I should try it on Gnome OS. I think that's what I should try. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think it's it's been there for at least a while. I think I've never had any I yeah, I I'm actually also not seeing it. Wait, wasn't that your book presentation was that thing that shifted the flat hub? Yeah, that's on flat hub. So he's referring to the using the flat hub flat Flat command to install. But the flat hub feature was not a flat pack. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. And, and we put with the information is there. So I don't have my own CSS or whatever. I there's at least a little bit of information that comes. I don't know if it's fully integrated. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Not to not one of the important. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did find that. There's something open up. 